What are you doing? I'm just in my appendix holster. Oh, is that what you call it? Oh, no, not that. I'm not doing that. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting. I wanted to start out this segment talking about some new concealed carry holsters that I got from my Glock 43 and talk about some options of, of how I'm kind of looking at carrying in the future as well as currently. Uh, if you're like me, you have a huge box of holsters, which I don't know how I did it, but I just literally misplaced this box of holsters. It was sitting on the wrong place in the shelf and I didn't even see it. So that's how much stuff we have here. I completely misplaced a whole box of holsters. Anyway, so what I wanted to start talking about today is the new Vanguard. Um, I just bought this from Raven Concealment. So this is their new 4243 edition for the Vanguard and I'm very excited about this. I ran one of the Vanguard 2s on my Glock 19 for a long time before the Glock 43 came out and gave a lower profile or a, a smaller uh, frame size uh, to shoot 9mm and carry that. That was really all that was available was, you know, carrying a 19. Even the Glock 26, which is still 9mm, is almost the same size as the full-framed Glock 19. It's just kind of got a, you know, a cut-down grip. Uh, whereas the Glock 43 actually has a single-stack magazine, like so. Um, so I prefer to carry that. It's a lot slimmer in profile, and that's kind of the big thing for me when it comes to concealed carry. I want a gun that is going to be very low profile because I carry appendix, which means I carry it, you know, close to the 12 o'clock position. If, if anything, it's like 1215 or so because I kind of kick it off to the side just a little bit and I'll sometimes can it too uh, just to, because I feel like even canting the, the holster carrying appendix even slightly kind of helps the concealment of the holster as well. So I'll, I'll kind of show you what all that looks like too. But so first off, again, the Vanguard 2, I'm really excited about this. They've kind of gone back to the drawing board a little bit, in, at least in my opinion. Um, I could be wrong, but it looks like there's been some really cool changes on the Vanguard 2. So one thing that I, the premise behind the Vanguard 2 is that it provides a complete isolation of the trigger guard. So the, the trigger guard itself is completely protected. So there's no chance of you, you know, getting your finger inside the trigger guard or anything like that, which makes it a very nice complete package for you know dropping in a bag or something like that too because everything's protected so I would I would have no qualms about you know somebody putting this in their purse somebody carrying it in a bag loose or something like that because everything that's important on this gun is protected uh, in terms of that so and it's very easy um, to just grab your hand in the front of the gun and, and knock that trigger guard or the Vanguard 2 off of that you know, to, to be up and ready to fire. So that's something you've got to practice too, is, you know, that motion of getting it off the gun too. But again, that's only a concern if you're using this um, in that method where there's nothing attached to it. You're not using the belt clip that's just sitting in a bag kind of ready to go like that. The other option that they advocate with the Vanguard 2 and it actually comes with a piece of small cordage. This is almost like small dummy cord. And you can take off the two Phillips head screws here for the belt clip and we basically tie on this piece of string um, to one side of the, the clip and then this goes you know, around something in your bag or what have you so that as soon as you draw that holster out, it catches, pulls this off and releases and it, it, it stays with whatever you're pulling it out of, which I think is a genius idea. I've always really liked that, the capability like that of the Vanguard 2. It's also got a very nice click. I'm sure you've heard that already. Um, it's you know, injection molded, it's super, tough when it comes to actually getting on the holster. So again, I'm pretty excited about this. I've been running the, the Haley Strategic Incog, which works out for me great. I very much love this holster, so this in no way is necessarily replacing the Incog, but this, the Vanguard 2 just allows me different carry options and it allows me um, a little bit easier placement around my body if I had to move the holster to a different position. So, you know, for instance, if I'm wearing a monkey suit or something like that, I don't carry appendix because you know, I tuck in my shirt like a normal gentleman and all that stuff. So um, I will, you know, move it around to like the five o'clock or so when I carry uh, in that type of situation. And I try to always have a jacket on. So, that, you know, there's that. 
And then, um, it's not that the NCOG can't handle that situation, I just feel like the Vanguard is a little more mobile. Um, it also is a little more low profile, and you'll see that in a second when I kind of demonstrate that, you know, in terms of, of how those look, you know, against the body. Um, the Vanguard is kind of the most minimalist holster that I feel comfortable with carrying, if that makes sense. So the other thing I'm checking out currently is the Burrito holster from HS, or sorry, <laughs> call it Gene's old company. I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, mean Gene Leather is his new company. Uh, I know Gene pretty well over there. I've been fortunate enough to be friends with him for quite a few years now. He's quite a character, and I love what he does over there. This is based on his uh, Burrito mag pouches. So same design with that. It's got this metal clip almost in the side there, and that's what, uses, that's what he uses for retention on the holster. So when this fits into the holster, you can see that that is now kind of that, that point of retention to, to keep the leather still. And I've also, I've kind of been looking at prototypes for a while with him. This was a, a thicker leather version that he had um, that I liked as well. Um, Obviously, I haven't even given this these the time to break in yet. I haven't carried them that much because I haven't had them that long. Um, and I like to alternate holsters, too, with a lot of the times because I'm always testing something out or, or evaluating something, if you will. So um, anyway, this holster, the, the burrito holster, was really more designed for use with a TLR6, which, if you know the Glock 43, the TLR6 is a light that kind of clips onto the, uh, the trigger guard right here, and that's kind of... Uh, a light option that you can have on a 43 since it doesn't have a dedicated rail like the 19 or something like that. So that's really the only option you're left with lighting wise is, uh, I think it's made by Streamlight, the Streamlight TLR6. So with that on there, you would get more of a, um, a retention with this. So it's got very light retention without that TLR6 and I don't have a TLR6 so I can't really comment on, on that necessarily. So um, and I don't really want to comment too much on the, the burrito holster because I haven't had that much time with it. It's very limited. I don't feel like I can really give you an you know, honest feedback of this yet other than it's very well built. So the leather on this is very stiff. Um, you can see between the two versions, he actually went with the thinner leather, which I like better. I like the thinner leather, um, but it's not so thin that it has any chance of you know, getting into the trigger guard or something with a, you know, the worn leather holster debacle we had years ago that we highlighted on ITS. So um, that's just a, a consideration. So he also utilizes the, the G-code clips, um, just like the uh, Haley Strategic NCOG does. So same type of clip system as you'll recognize on this. And I, I very much like this clip system. I'm a huge fan of this that you know, Haley uses on the NCOG. So it's nice to see that on, on this holster as well. So. The way I have this set up is almost at the very same height. You can see that I kind of kick this up a notch from what it is here, but the place that it sits for on you know my body carry is about the same position. So what I want to do real quick is just show you what all these look like basically in the concealed position uh, so you can see the difference. So I'll start with um, kind of the largest, the mean gene holster, and go backwards, if you will. So this is about where I carry. I kind of kick it like this so it's slanted and then you can see kind of the the dimension here as this sticks out so this is kind of the profile as I'm carrying it so that's one Let me go with the incog so this is the incog front it's the incog from the side profile And then the Vanguard. From the front. And then from the side. So you can, hopefully you can notice that the Vanguard is about, you know, the lowest profile that you can get, in my opinion, other than carrying without a holster completely, which you don't want to do. So um, that's my... That's my two cents, if you will, about some holster options for the 43. I just wanted to walk you through some of those and kind of what I'm kind of up to as far as what I'm evaluating holster-wise. So I've got the Vanguard 2 from Raven Concealment. You've got the INCOG, the Haley INCOG from uh, Haley Strategic or G-Code. Uh, and then you've got the Mean Gene Leather Burrito Holster. So a couple options.
Welcome to Questions Over Coffee. First question comes from Crazy Kid Joe on YouTube who asks, we'll be needing a video for the lacing method. While I love my Loa boots, I hate the hooks at the top of the boot. Well, you're in luck. I'm going to demonstrate it. This um, has been a member only video on ITS for quite a few years now, but I wanted to kind of share the wealth a little around a little bit and kind of show you on the public facing side too. So this was, again, I mentioned this on Gear Tasting Radio, I think when we were talking about footwear but this was taught to me by a dude from REI when I bought my very first pair of Loa Renegades and it kind of blew my mind. I was like, that's really odd that I've never seen that kind of lacing method. It was very strange to me, but I gave it a shot and I've fallen in love with it over the years. So the way this works, this is called the, the mountaineering way to lace your boots. So what I do is, you know, I get the boot tight on my foot and then I do like a triple wrap. So you know, just like you're wrapping to tie, you know, an overhand knot, you're going to wrap three times. So that's twice, three times. And it looks something like that. And then you pull to tighten, just like that, and it kind of locks the lace in. So the premise behind this mountaineering technique is that it locks your heel into the boot better than any other method out there. So there's a heel lock that this kind of ends with, and that's kind of a common thing with uh, climbers and I've known that technique for quite a while I've probably more than 10 years since I've been climbing quite a while that's that was taught to me kind of when I got my first pair of climbing shoes but all right so once you have that you're going to then come up to the next hole just like this so you'll come this way up the boot so you can see I'm not crossing with this so I'm not taking it like this and tightening and then you know kind of crossing like this I'm not doing that I'm coming straight up the side to the next eyelet or next hook or should I say the first hook in the boot so that's the first hook and then I'm going to do the same thing again so triple wrap two three and tighten again so now I've got two basically locking wraps in the boot and then I'm going to come straight up again so if you look at the sides it looks like this so I'm going to come straight up the next two hooks, just like that. And then I'm going to cross like this. But when I cross, so it'll make the X, right? But then when I cross, I'm actually going to come between those two hooks. So holding tension on this side, I'm going to pass it right through there, just like that. And then same thing with the other side. I'm going to pass it right through that. So this is the common heel lock technique that's, that's around with climbing shoes. So uh, you would do this through two of the, eye, the top most eye holes or eyelets in the boot, or I'm sorry, in the climbing shoe. You would do the same lock. So what this is doing is it's really kind of pulling your heel into the back of the boot at this point. So, and then I've got two different ways that I do this. So if I'm really worried about my laces coming untied, I'll do a square knot at this point. So I'm going to tie a square knot in the boot, just like that, and then I'll tuck my, the remainder of the laces in into my sock, basically like this. So that's one thing I'll do. And then the second thing that I do commonly, if I'm, I'm more worried about the ease of getting them off fast, I'll, I'll just do a you know, standard you know, bow knot, and then I'll just do a double knot. So that's kind of what I'll do too. So it's always either at least double knotted or square knotted in my boots to finish the, the knot. So Again, that is the mountaineering way to tie your shoes. Hopefully, Crazy Kid Joe, that's a good demonstration. All right, next question is from Chris M. from Facebook. Since you've gotten into precision marksmanship, have you thought about rechambering or building an AR in 6.5 Grendel? No. Um, I just haven't. I'm really digging the 6.5 Creedmoor. I love the BC on it. In my opinion, there's no reason to get anything rebarreled in a 6.5 uh, Grendel. I just haven't, I haven't had the desire to do that. I'm kind of all in, if you will, with the 6.5 Creedmoor. Like I said in the reloading question about whether I've got reloading supplies that I actually had, but I said I didn't. Um, I've got plenty of bullets and everything that I need to make 6.5 Creedmoor cartridges along with the empty brass I've been saving from shooting Creedmoor. So 
I'm kind of all in. I'm not looking to change, so hopefully that answers your question. Next question is from Chris T on Twitter. I noticed you ditched the Siloom uh, foil wrappers on chem lights. Doesn't that shorten shelf life? So I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on chem lights, but I have never really cared about saving the foil or keeping things in the foil wrapper. Um, I, j I have been through so many chem lights that are so expired that still work for me that it's never even been a problem. So like, for instance, this one says an expiration date of 0820. It's relatively new. It's open like this. We use these at muster and this is just kind of a leftover one. So this is the way we prep them at muster. So we, and this is kind of a leftover from buds. This is the way we prepped them uh, when I was working hell week support after I got injured for a class. So um, we would use green chem lights on the starboard side of the boat, the boats, like the big, uh, they call those, um, man. The inflatable boats, IBS. wing, yeah, IBS, yeah, thanks. Inflatable boat, small. Um, anyway, we would use those uh, for that. So green would go on the right side of the boat or the starboard side. Uh, red would go on the left-hand side or, or port side. So we would prep them like this with rubber bands. You're basically just girth hitching a rubber band over the hole that's in the chem light. Then you take this, wrap it around the handle on the boat, and then you know, you've got your chem light all ready to go and rigged. So we'd store them like this so that they're, they're kind of ready to go. So you'd, you'd loop this around, you'd leave the wrapper on there, and you'd stage the boats like that. And then when you're ready to use them, you'd pull the wrapper off, crack the chem light, and you're ready to go. And that's kind of how I got into the, you know, the way to store these like that. And it's never really been an issue. Um, in my kit, I have many chem lights that um, don't have the wrappers on them completely. I even have some mini ones that I kind of ride on the outside of my kit that don't have them either. And I've never really seen a degradation with those. What, the place where that might come into play is UV light. So if they're exposed to the elements like heat, UV light, all that kind of stuff, it will, it will shorten the shelf life of them. But if you're storing them in some type of climate controlled area, if they're sitting on, on your kit in the closet or, you know, even in this warehouse during the summer, I don't really worry about it. Even though it's hot, they're not getting directly exposed to UV light. So it's not really ever been an issue for me. So, um, we used to, you know, in the Navy, they used to store chem lights in the mill vans too, which gets incredibly hot. Even in San Diego, they would get pretty hot in there. So, um, hopefully that answers your question. I, I don't worry about it. Hopefully you learned a way to prep and store chem lights. These rubber bands will degrade and you can use rigorous rubber bands, but it's really tough to get them through that hole. You have to kind of bore out the hole a little bit if you want to use rigorous rubber bands, but they will last a lot longer staged on chem lights than traditional rubber bands will. All right, guys, thanks for watching Gear Taste. And remember, if you have any questions, use the pound tag Gear Tasting right there on any social media network. And we'll get your questions answered here on Gear Tasting. As always, check out our store if you're looking to purchase something. We might have what you need. Store.itstitle.com or consider joining our membership to help support the show. The crew leader details are below. It will allow us to give you back something in return as well. Thanks for watching.